In the low-ceilinged canteen, deep underground, the lunch queue jerked slowly forward. The room was already very full and deafeningly noisy. From the grill at the counter, the steam of stew came pouring forth with a sour, metallic smell which did not quite overcome the fumes of Victory Gin. On the far side of the room there was a small bar, a mere hole in the wall, where gin could be bought for ten cents a large nip. Just the man I was looking for, said a voice at Winston's back. He turned round. It was his friend, Sign, who worked in the research department. Perhaps friend was not exactly the right word. You did not have friends nowadays. You had comrades. But there were some comrades whose society was pleasanter than that of others. Sign was a philologist, a specialist in newspeak. Indeed, he was one of the enormous team of experts now engaged in compiling the 11th edition of the Newspeak Dictionary. He was a tiny creature, smaller than Winston, with dark hair and large, protuberant eyes, at once mournful and derisive, which seemed to search your face closely while he was speaking to you. I wanted to ask you whether you'd got any razor blades, he said. Not one, said Winston, with a sort of guilty haste, I've tried all over the place. They don't exist any longer. Everyone kept asking you for razor blades. Actually, he had two unused ones, which he was hoarding up. There had been a famine of them for months past. At any given moment, there was some necessary article which the party shops were unable to supply. Sometimes it was buttons, sometimes it was darning wool, sometimes it was shoelaces. At present, it was razor blades. You could only get hold of them, if at all, by scrounging more or less furtively on the free market. I've been using the same blade for six weeks, he added untruthfully. The queue gave another jerk forward. As they halted, he turned and faced Syme again. Each of them took a greasy metal tray from a pile at the edge of the counter. Did you go and see the prisoners hanged yesterday, said Syme. I was working, said Winston, indifferently. I shall see it on the flicks, I suppose. A very inadequate substitute, said Syme. His mocking eyes roved over Winston's face. I know you, the eyes seemed to say. I see through you. I know very well why you didn't go to see those prisoners hanged. In an intellectual way, Syme was venomously orthodox. He would talk with a disagreeable, gloating satisfaction of helicopter raids on enemy villages, the trials and confessions of thought criminals, the executions in the cellars of the Ministry of Love. Talking to him was largely a matter of getting him away from such subjects and entangling him, if possible, in the technicalities of Newspeak, on which he was authoritative and interesting. Winston turned his head a little aside to avoid the scrutiny of the large, dark eyes. It was a good hanging, said Syme, reminiscently. I think it spoils it when they tie their feet together. I like to see them kicking. And above all, at the end, the tongue sticking right out and blue quite bright blue. That's the detail that appeals to me. Next, please, yelled the white-aproned pole with the ladle. Winston and Syme pushed their trays beneath the grill. Onto each was dumped swiftly the regulation lunch, a metal pannikin of pinkish-gray stew, a hunk of bread, a cube of cheese, a mug of milkless victory coffee, and one saccharine tablet. There's a table over there, under that telescreen, said Syme, Let's pick up a gin on the way. The gin was served out to them in handless, handleless china mugs. They threaded their way across the crowded room and unpacked their trays onto the metal-topped table, on one corner of which someone had left a pool of stew, a filthy liquid mess that had the appearance of vomit. Winston took up his mug of gin, paused for an instant to collect his nerve, and gulped the oily-tasting stuff down. When he had winked the tears out of his eyes, he suddenly discovered that he was hungry. He began swallowing spoonfuls of the stew, which, in among its general sloppiness, had cubes of spongy, pinkish stuff, which was probably a preparation of meat. Neither of them spoke again till they had emptied their pannikins. From the table at Winston's left, a little behind his back, someone was talking rapidly and continuously, a harsh gabble, almost like the quacking of a duck, which pierced the general uproar of the room. How's the dictionary getting on? said Winston, raising his voice to overcome the noise. 
Slowly, said Syme, I'm on the adjectives. It's fascinating. He had brightened up immediately at the mention of new speed. He pushed his pannikin aside, took up his hunk of bread in one delicate hand and his cheese in the other, and leaned across the table so as to be able to speak without shouting. The eleventh edition is the definitive edition, he said. We're getting the language into its final shape, the shape it's going to have when nobody speaks anything else. When we've finished with it, people like you will have to learn it all over again. You think, I dare say, that our chief job is inventing new words, but not a bit of it. We're destroying words, scores of them, hundreds of them, every day. We're cutting the language down to the bone. The eleventh edition won't contain a single word that will become obsolete before the year 2050. He bit hungrily into his bread and swallowed a couple of mouthfuls, then continued speaking with a sort of pedant's passion. His thin, dark face had become animated. His eyes had lost their mocking expression and grown almost dreamy. It's a beautiful thing, the destruction of words. Of course, the great wastage is in the verbs and adjectives. But there are hundreds of nouns that can be got rid of as well. It isn't only the synonyms. There are also the antonyms. After all, what justification is there for a word which is simply the opposite of some other word? A word contains its opposite in itself. Take good, for instance. If you have a word like good, what need is there for a word like bad? Ungood will do just as well. Better, because it's an exact opposite, which the other is not. Or again, if you want a stronger version of good, what sense is there in having a whole string of vague, useless words like excellent and splendid and all the rest of them? Plus good covers the meaning, or double plus good, if you want something stronger still. Of course, we use those forms already, but in the final version of Newspeak, there'll be nothing else. In the end, the whole notion of goodness and badness will be covered by only six words, in reality only one word. Don't you see the beauty of that, Winston? It was B.B.'s idea originally, of course, he added as an afterthought. A sort of vapid eagerness flitted across Winston's face at the mention of Big Brother. Nevertheless, Syme immediately detected a certain lack of enthusiasm. You haven't a real appreciation of new speak, Winston, he said almost sadly. Even when you write it, you're still thinking in old speak. I've read some of those pieces that you write in the Times occasionally. They're good enough, but they're translations. In your heart, you'd prefer to stick to old speak with all its vagueness and its useless shades of meaning. You don't grasp the beauty of the destruction of words. Do you know that Newspeak is the only language in the world whose vocabulary gets smaller every year? Winston did know that, of course. He smiled sympathetically, he hoped, not trusting himself to speak. Syme bit off another fragment of the dark-colored bread, chewed it briefly, and went on. Don't you see that the whole aim of Newspeak is to narrow the range of thought? In the end, we shall make thought crime literally impossible, because there will be no words in which to express it. Every concept that can ever be needed will be expressed by exactly one word, with its meaning rigidly defined, and all its subsidiary meanings rubbed out and forgotten. Already in the eleventh edition, we're not far from that point but the process will still be continuing long after you and I are dead. Every year, fewer and fewer words, and the range of consciousness always a little smaller. Even now, of course, there's no reason or excuse for committing thought crime. It's merely a question of self-discipline, reality control. But in the end, there won't be any need even for that. The revolution will be complete when the language is perfect. Newspeak is Ingsoc, and Ingsoc is Newspeak, he added with a sort of mystical satisfaction. Has it ever occurred to you, Winston, but the, that by the year 20, 2050, at the very latest, not a single human being will be alive who could understand such a conversation as we are having now? Except, began Winston doubtfully, and then stopped. It had been on the tip of his tongue to say, except the proles, but he checked himself, not feeling fully certain that this remark was not in some way unorthodox. Syme, however, had divined what he was about to say. The proles are not human beings, he said carelessly. By 2050, earlier probably, all real knowledge of old speak will have disappeared. The whole literature of the past will have been destroyed. Chaucer, Shakespeare, Milton, Byron, 
They'll exist only in Newspeak versions, not merely changed into something different, but actually changed into something contradictory of what they used to be. Even the literature of the party will change. Even the slogans will change. How could you have a slogan like, freedom is slavery, when the concept of freedom has been abolished? The whole climate of thought will be different. In fact, there will be no thought, as we understand it now. Orthodoxy means not thinking, not needing to think. Orthodoxy is unconsciousness. One of these days, thought Winston with sudden deep conviction, Syme will be vaporized. He is too intelligent. He sees too clearly and speaks too plainly. The party does not like such people. One day he will disappear. It is written in his face. Winston had finished his bread and cheese. He turned a little sideways in his chair to drink his mug of coffee. At the table on his left, the man with the strident voice was still talking remorselessly away. A young woman who was perhaps his secretary and who was sitting with her back to Winston was listening to him and seemed to be eagerly agreeing with everything that he said. From time to time, Winston caught some such remark as, I think you're so right, I do so agree with you, uttered in a youthful and rather silly feminine voice. But the other voice never stopped for an instant, even when the girl was speaking. Winston knew the man by sight, though he knew no more about him than that he held some important post in the fiction department. He was a man of about 30, with a muscular throat and a large, mobile mouth. His head was thrown back a little, and because of the angle at which he was sitting, his spectacles caught the light and presented to Winston two blank discs instead of eyes. What was slightly horrible was that from the stream of sound that poured out of his mouth, it was almost impossible to distinguish a single word. Just once Winston caught a phrase, complete and final elimination of Goldsteinism, jerked out very rapidly and as it seemed all in one piece, like a line of type cast solid. For the rest, it was just a noise, a quack, quack, quacking. And yet, though you could not actually hear what the man was saying, you could not be in any doubt about its general nature. He might be denouncing Goldstein and demanding sterner measures against thought criminals and saboteurs. He might be fulminating against the atrocities of the Eurasian army. He might be praising Big Brother or the heroes of the Malabar Front. It made no difference. Whatever it was, you could be certain that every word of it was pure orthodoxy, pure Ingsoc. As he watched the eyeless face with the jaw moving rapidly up and down, Winston had a curious feeling that this was not a real human being, but some kind of dummy. It was not the man's brain that was speaking. It was his larynx. The stuff that was coming out of him consisted of words, but it was not speech in the true sense. It was a noise uttered in unconsciousness, like the quacking of a duck. Syme had fallen silent for a moment, and with the handle of his spoon was tracing patterns in the puddle of stew. The voice from the other table quacked rapidly on, easily audible, in spite of the surrounding din. There is a word in Newspeak, said Syme. I don't know whether you know it. Duck speak, to quack like a duck. It is one of those interesting words that have two contradictory meanings. Applied to an opponent, opponent, it is abuse. Applied to someone you agree with, it is praise. Unquestionably, Syme will be vaporized, Winston thought again. He thought it with a kind of sadness, although well knowing that Syme despised him and slightly disliked him, and was fully capable of denouncing him as a thought criminal if he saw any reason for doing so. There was something subtly wrong with Syme. There was something that he lacked discretion, aloofness, a sort of saving stupidity. You could not say that he was unorthodox. He believed in the principles of Ingsoc. He venerated Big Brother. He rejoiced over victories. He hated heretics, not merely with sincerity, but with a sort of restless zeal, an up-to-dateness of information, which the ordinary party member did not approach. Yet a faint air of disreputability always clung to him. He said things that would have been better unsaid. He had read too many books. He frequented the Chestnut Tree Café, haunt of painters and musicians. There was no law, not even an unwritten law, against frequenting the Chestnut Tree Café. Yet the place was somehow ill-omened. The old, discredited leaders of the party had been used to gather there before they were finally purged. Goldstein himself, it was said, had sometimes been seen there years and decades ago. Syme's fate was not difficult to foresee. 
And yet it was a fact that if Syme grasped, even for three seconds, the nature of his, Winston's, secret opinions, he would betray him instantly to the thought police. So would anybody else, for that matter, but Syme more than most. Zeal was not enough. Orthodoxy was unconsciousness.